What's the story behind the paparazzi chasing Harry and Meghan? Are William and Kate getting their social media strategy all wrong? And will the king turn off Andrew's electricity? We'll have the answers to all of those questions and more coming right up. Hello and welcome to Palace Confidential. I'm Jo Elvin and as long as those royal stories keep coming, we will keep discussing them. So if you'd like more royal videos from the best royal experts, make sure you subscribe to our channel and never miss another episode. Now back with me today are the Daily Mail's royal editor Rebecca English and the paper's diary editor Richard Eden. Welcome to you both. And after a very distressing week off for a lot of people. The Palace Confidential montage is back. Stick to the end of the show to find out who the star of this week's is. Now, we will get to the big Sussex story in a bit, but we'll start today with the comings and goings at Windsor. Rebecca, first up, this story of this really tearful and reluctant departure of the late Queen's dresser. Yes, yeah, so on the Daily Mail this week, we have some exclusive photographs of Angela Kelly packing up her belongings at her home in Windsor. She's already revealed on social media that she's going to be heading to the Peak District uh, to be closer to family. But she looked very emotional during this, um, during her packing up. And obviously, you know, it's a big wrench for her because she spent 25 years of her life working for Queen Elizabeth at Windsor. Mm -hmm. And there's a bit of a question as to whether she's going by choice or whether she's being kicked out. What I do know is that the King has bought a house for her in the Peak District so uh, she can live there um, and that will revert to the Crown once she's died. So, Will, will Camilla have an equivalent figure as the Queen? Is, you know, is, 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 or is it something that Angela could have done for Camilla? Well, she does have her own. She's brilliant, actually. She's a lady called Jackie. She's um, a Geordie, and I, I love her. She's great, actually. <laughs> Can we call She's... her Geordie Jackie? <laughs> yeah. And she actually worked for the late Queen Mother, uh, as in Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother, and then stayed on and started working for Camilla when she was Duchess of Cornwall, has now stayed on with her as, as, as Queen. Crikey, forgive um, me. How old is she? Do you know what? Indeterminate age, but she looks amazing. <laughs> yeah. I, I, as you would expect, yeah. express of a dresser, she's really stylish and yeah. she's just got a great sense of humour with it, which I suspect is why the Queen likes having her around. And there was the reason why I hesitated when answering it, there was a bit of toing and froing after the death of Queen Elizabeth and Buckingham Palace staff didn't know whether they would be kept in a job. People at Clarence House didn't know if they were going to be able to move over and actually quite a few people did lose their jobs in the end. Mm. But Camilla's dresser is not one of those. Good old Jackie hanging in there. Now Richard, meanwhile, there was an extraordinary story in the Mail on Sunday discussing Prince Andrew's fears about being kicked out of his home. Oh my goodness. I mean, you really know things have got bad when you start seeing headlines about, you know, they're going to cut off the electricity. Well, there is a cost of living cut crisis. Cut off the water. Yeah. I mean, things, I, I think things haven't really gone the way that the King wanted, because I think, you know, there was sort of, it was made clear that um, the King wanted his brother, Prince Andrew, to move out of Royal Lodge. Um, and I think he was sort of hoping he'd say, yes, fine, I'll move into perhaps into Frogmore Cottage where Harry and Meghan used to live. Because how big is, remind us how big this Royal Lodge is. Yeah, so Royal Lodge is essentially a palace. It's, it's a mansion at Windsor, massive. Um, but Prince Andrew, quite rightly, thinks, why on earth should I move? You know, I spent all my money um, doing up this house. Um, he's got, a, I think it's a 75-year lease, so he's, he's got it for life. And I think he's outraged at the idea that he should have to move at all. So there seems to be a real um, standoff. And that's what this Mail on Sunday story was about, of essentially what happens next. Gosh, do you think that Andrew, he really doesn't want to move out. Will he be sitting there with his candles and his sort of like gas burner if, if he uses his utilities? It's a great image, isn't it? <laughs> you, you <laughs> that came to that, me. That's never going to happen. You, you can't oh, cut off someone's electricity. It's against the law. I mean, there, there is stalemate. So where do they go from here? The King's made really clear, we feel that you should move out. Andrew's saying, no way I'm doing that. I took on that lease in good faith. Um, and I, as you rightly say, I part of that lease was I expected to use my own money to do up the property. Um, why should I stay? But then there are the optics. I mean, in this day and age, is it right that a non-working royal should be living in a fabulous 30-roomed house, just him and his, his ex-wife? Um, you know, it's quite difficult to justify in this day and age. Yeah, but also Prince Andrew's friends say, you know, 
why, did it, why does King Charles want that house back anyway? Because think about it, if it's going to be given to Prince William and Catherine and their family, as has been rumoured, you know, then you would have them moving into this enormous mansion that will have another load of money, huge sum spent on it to improve it. And that's in addition to the massive apartments they've got at Kensington Palace. So in a way, you know, Andrew's friends say it's better to have Andrew and Fergie and family sort of using that rather than all the bad publicity that would ensue from William and Catherine moving in. Well, Sarah Vine, the Daily Mail columnist, wrote, and she, as usual, pulled no punches, <laughs> comparing Andrew and Angela Kelly and saying, if anyone should be banished hundreds of miles from Windsor, surely it should be Andrew, not a 65-year-old woman who looked after the Queen's late mother for more than 25 years. Do we think that's fair? I th think, um, with respect to my colleague, I think that's a, a little unfair um, in the sense that, first of all, we don't know the exact personal circumstances surrounding Angela Kelly. You know, perhaps she's happy to move and she's clearly being looked after. So I think banished, you know, is, is obviously a strong language. Um, but Andrew has a right. He's got the legal right to stay. Um, but w one big weapon which King Charles has got um, to use if he wants to is all about um, personal protection, that he's agreed to keep paying for bodyguards for Andrew, even though Andrew is not a working royal. So obviously he could say, well, you know, if you don't move out, I'm going to stop paying for that. And I don't think Andrew has the money to pay for his own protection. So that, that would be kind of the ultimate um, nuclear option. Gosh, this is all a reminder, isn't it, Rebecca, that the king is the king now. And, you know, obviously I know, but he's not his mother. And that, and that realisation is probably quite difficult for many people. Yeah, and he has to do things differently. There are different pressures on him than there were on his mother in terms of justifying the cost of the royal family, the personnel, the houses, the people that they employ. He's got to look at these things with quite a quite a kind of cold business head and really take family out of the equation. If you've got a, a member of the family that isn't working for them for a living, how can you justify this? Mm. Well, there is more to discuss about the Waleses, the Sussexes and a lot more, but I want to turn quickly to your comments now. And lots of you had something to say about our discussion last week as to whether or not William should be the one to reach out to Harry to try and repair that relationship. Kaza Swan agrees with Rebecca, who would dare disagree with Rebecca, but she writes, people shouldn't bully William into patching up his relationship with a toxic brother. If he chooses to do that later, he should do it because he truly wants to. While Lynn Gee says, forgiveness is one thing, trust is entirely another. Think on about that. And like a lot of you, Lisa K. Perry was delighted by last week's video of the Prince of Wales playing on the digger with his sons. She says, I truly think that William was having just as much fun with the digger as the kids. I think Rebecca would agree with you there. And if you missed that video, make sure to check out last week's episode. And after our discussion on whether Charles will be still sharing his personal opinions now that he's king, Lady Shikari, that's a fabulous name, Lady Shikari believes that it will be hard for him, saying he's a different type of of royal and a different type of king who thinks differently to the late queen. We know the subjects King Charles feels are important and being fair and including everyone is what he feels is important. Well said, thank you very much. Now please do keep those comments coming in but for now let's get back to my panel and Rebecca, a spokesman for the Duke and Duchess of Sussex, released a statement last night claiming that the pair and Meghan's mother were involved in, I quote, a near catastrophic car chase. What can you tell us about this? Well, this statement came completely out of the blue. It was suddenly released by the couple's spokesperson in the US. And exactly as you say, it was a very emotive statement. It said that following uh, an appearance at an award ceremony, they were followed by a large number of paparazzi. They described their behavior as being very aggressive. It, 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 they embarked on this kind of two hour uh, kind of cat and mouse game around New York. Now overnight, other accounts have come out um, suggesting that while it was indeed chaotic and people aren't defending the behavior of the paparazzi, there are police officers both on and on the record suggesting it, 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 was, it was aggressive and it was troublesome and it was chaotic, but it wasn't near catastrophic. Um, and I think this kind of debate about it will rumble on. But obviously what it has at the heart of it is Harry's relationship with the media, I think. Mm. And 
the fact that he experienced some some pretty unpleasant behavior at the hands of photographers when he was a young man it goes back to losing his mother in that very tragic incident in Paris and I think for some people they will understand whatever the behavior of the paparazzi was whether it was as bad as Harry says or whether people believe other accounts I think a lot of people will understand it probably was a very triggering incident for him mm. uh, being uh, pursued by people in that way. Now, Richard, all of this came as the Sussexes were in New York, where Meghan used a familiar phrase while she was accepting an award. Yeah, they do seem to have accepted quite a few awards recently. Uh, which the multi-award winning Duke and Jackson. <laughs> it's interesting. Jackson. I mean, awards generally are not something which, you know, the royal family accept, but now they're free of free from the royal family's constraints, they can accept as many awards as they like. And this was an award for Meghan's advocacy, I think, for girls. It's from the Miss Foundation. Um, and she used um, the opportunity, this grand stage, which obviously has become even more of a story with all the attention about the um, you know, um, chase and everything out, mm. outside. It's become a much bigger story. And this was all about service, her speech. And it, it's been a real sort of eye-opener because you know, service is something which we very much um, attach to the royal family. We associate with the royal family. And that was emphasised in the coronation with um, King Charles as he entered Westminster Abbey saying, you know, I come to serve and not be served. Yeah. And then that was highlighted in Prince William during his speech at the coronation concert where he referred to that. You know, service, and it was something Queen Elizabeth always emphasised, the royal family is about service. And I think Harry and Meghan, that's always sort of rankled with them in the sense that they think you, you don't need to be in the royal family to serve. And when they quit royal duties, they made that point. They came out with a soundbite about service is universal. Yeah. And Meghan's returned to that theme of, you know, we're here to serve. But for me, I don't know, it just made me feel slightly sick, frankly, because, you know, so the service, their idea of service seems to be about service to themselves, service about making money. You know, they left the royal family um, to make money. They wanted to be free to do so. And yes, they have charitable interests, but they also, they mix them up with their personal interests and they always, you know, they're making money as well as serving. And is, that, that, is that a crime? Um, it's definitely not a crime. And it's something that anyone can do, but it makes me uncomfortable. The whole, the whole sort of subject makes me uncomfortable, frankly. Do you think it's too blurred, Rebecca? What, what does service mean in the context of quote unquote non-working royals? Well, as Richard rightly says, yeah, this whole thing was was one of the one of the big issues that they and the rest of the royal family butted heads over over the very acrimonious departure as working royals. The late Queen Elizabeth, and uh, I know Harry seems to think she was manipulated in this, from, from what I hear, she was very definite about her decision on this, that she felt that you could not pursue lucrative commercial opportunities and serve in the way that working members of the royal family do. She wasn't saying you can't serve, you can't do charity work, you can't do good things, but she was saying you can't do them in the context of the royal family because we are expected to do things in a certain way. Mm. And someone explained it to me at the time. Say, for example, I don't know, Prince of Wales went to uh, you know, a restaurant, a community restaurant, and there was a brand of coffee that he happened to be privately involved with would it be seen as a conflict of interest you know they said it, it there was just so, it was so many pitfalls along the way if they tried to do that mm. that it just was impossible but as, as Richard said Harry and Meghan really took against this and and issued a really stinging rebuke to Queen Elizabeth saying service is universal we can do it anywhere she was just making the point you cannot serve in the way the royal family does. Yeah. That was the difference. Um, and obviously they're you know, making a point of saying we can do good works outside of the royal family. So do you think that that term used in that speech was provocative? We'll probably disagree on this. I, I don't think it was provocative, but I do, overly provocative, but I do think they do make a point all the time of saying 
serve, service, service, because this is a big issue for them. I, I think it, it was pointed. It was, you know, they've got this dual life at the moment where on the one hand, um, you know, like Megan's just signed up with a major Hollywood agency, she's looking for lucrative roles, and then also they're accepting these awards and then talking about the service and, you know, doing charitable work on the side as well. Um, so I think she wanted to make a point with this speech, and, and she did. Well, let's move to the Walesers now. And Richard, they found themselves, compared to their transatlantic in-laws this week, with their new approach to social media. What can you tell us? This is um, a really interesting subject, and it's got people talking, particularly in rural circles. And this is to do with the new um, videos, which some of them quite lengthy. One of them's like a kind of mini movie of Very five, glossy. about four or five minutes. Um, and they're, they're really impressive. You know, they're videos, they, they started with a pre-coronation one, and they've been releasing a few over the course of the coronation and since. And they've been about um, trying to show a sort of behind the scenes look at um, how they are and putting it in a a kind of dramatic form, really. But it, it, it did look like the crown, didn't it? It yeah. looked like, you know, it really did. <laughs> they did. Um, but they're sort of, the, the reason they've really sort of raised eyebrows is because they're different from what we expect in that sense of being very professional. Um, Sarah Vine, who we spoke about earlier, she was critical. She was saying they're, you know, too slick, they look too manipulative, that type of thing. But um, the key thing is that they're trying to reach um, a younger audience and people who, you know, are less um, supportive of the, the royal family generally and people who might not know what they're up to about, you know, good work. So, What do you think, Rebecca? Do you think, Sarah, I mean, I think Sarah Vine was essentially saying it's a bit self-involved and it's taking the limelight from the king in his coronation week. Do you think that's fair? I, I don't. I have to say, I, you know, I, th I think Sarah's brilliant, but I disagree with her on this. I mean, I wrote a big feature about this on for the Daily Mail this week about this kind of social media blitz they're doing. And as, as Richard rightly says, this is all about engaging with younger people. The opinion polls are showing that support for the monarchy is still high, but there's a real generational difference. Uh, the support is... Is, is really rock solid amongst the older generation, but not so much amongst the younger generation. So the Waleses have been looking at this for a while and they've really ramped it up since Easter. How do we tell our story to these people? How do we engage them in what we're doing? Not just us as people or our families, but what the work we're doing, the stories, we're, the difference we're trying to make in terms of whether it's homelessness, mental health, you know, education, the environment, we want them to see. And, and one of the ways that they've decided to do this is to be a, a, bit, a bit slicker with their social media because that's how young people consume their news nowadays. Mm. Now, the jury's still out a little bit on whether this is the right way to do it because these these social media clips are are almost too well put together. There's a lot of jazzy music that and goes with arguably it. Arguably, um, they could be a little bit alienating for younger generations. Yeah. They? There's so, so much wealth, so much gloss. Yeah, I mean, so the jury, I think, is still out amongst the wider royal household, but there is support for them trying to engage people in a different way. One person who used to work for the royal household and you know, still involved in this, said to me, I think they've got the right idea, but maybe they need to deploy them a bit more carefully. You know, do a bit of the more authentic day-to-day mm. -day stuff and employ these kind of freelance video um, filmmakers to do something when there's something really important to say. And Richard, according to your column today, the King and Queen are now getting in on this act. <laughs> this, this, this is great this, fun, this isn't it? This social media we, is going to catch on. <laughs> we're going to see a competition. I wonder, you know, where will it lead? Will we have them, you know, on TikTok eventually with rival, rival clips? Doing crazy dancers. But, um, to be clear, what this story was about, that it is um, King Charles and Queen Camilla are now advertising for their own sort of videographer, um, you know, it's Sort of saying, you know, digital guru to come and make their own videos, which are likely to be similar, you know, quite slick. But um, so it's, it's, quite, it's quite amusing. But um, that, that's what you know. That's what you've got to do if you want to reach different age groups. I it's think. interesting you say that, Richard, because I noticed um, late last night a video of uh, Charles and Camilla doing uh, an engagement at Covent Garden yesterday, and it was a very similar format. It was it was a shot, really high resolution. <laughs> There was some kind of groovy music to go with it of them shaking hands, <laughs> kids waving uh, Union Jack. So it started already. 
And again, I was a bit, well, let, you know, let's see, let's see how it goes. You have, you have to wonder what the king thinks of all of this new, <laughs> newfangled <laughs> way to communicate. Uh, Re Rebecca made the point in her feature that they're, they're not on TikTok yet, and that's quite controversial because the British government is not on TikTok, and there's lots of reservations. It's a, you know, Chinese originally a Chinese-owned company. Yes. Um, so it's questionable whether the royals will join TikTok. But I, I do love the idea of Charles and Camilla doing a sort of dance, you know, a dance off with William. And I think it'll be quite good. AI will do it for them, even if they don't. <laughs> maybe, really do. maybe you should be their social media manager, Richard. <laughs> but they have had, in the feature I revealed, they have had talks with TikTok, uh, William and Kate's people. But I think that was more just to kind of see how it works rather than actually putting their own social media. They've already got, I think, they've got YouTube, Twitter, Instagram. There's a Royal Facebook channel. So I think they're focusing on the channels they've got. But I think my kind of payoff line was don't rule it out that you'd And never on that point, on I should say that you can see us now. I on, was about um, to say, is it da Daily Mail Royal? Daily Mail Royals, yeah. On TikTok. Yeah, don't miss it. Well, this week, Zara Tyndall, said to be the Queen's favourite grandchild, turns 42. Happy birthday to you baby, infant. But to celebrate, we've dedicated this week's montage to her. Zara Tyndall there and a reminder that if you enjoy our content do remember to like and subscribe so that you don't miss any of our royal shows like this one. We hope you've enjoyed it. Well we've had fun and thanks to Rebecca and Richard and to you for watching and we will see you next week on Palace Confidential. Bye bye.